All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is PXJS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week. And uh, yes, uh, we are continuing our experiment with the getting started section. So I've heard your feedback. Thank you very much for uh, basically letting me know how you like it. The feedback so far was that you like the idea of splitting the beginner articles in a separate section, but you did not like me just sitting here and reading through the titles of them, right? So we're gonna switch it up a bit. I'm still gonna keep it as a separate section, but I'm gonna change the way I am basically read them, right? And uh, do let me know if you like this way better or if you have any other suggestions. Again, I'm open for that. Um, so there we go. Hey, Donna, welcome to the stream. Uh, let us get started with uh, getting started section, which uh, getting started, getting started section sounds a bit silly, but you know what, let's just, let's just get going, right? We got quite a bunch of articles today. So the first article we got here is for those of you who just started working with JavaScript and are curious about what memoize is and how does it work. Uh, the article is called understand how to memoize a JavaScript function. The next one we've got here is talking about the testing react components with react testing library. It's called testing stateful react function components with react testing library. If you're looking for something like this, do check it out. Next beginner article we got here is a sync await. 60% of the time it works every time. Essentially talks about uh, the fact that, you know, you don't always want to use a sync await and you actually want to mix it up together with the promises themselves, which is a pretty good idea. I mean, the use case in this article might not be too convincing, but the general gist is quite good. So check it out. Next article we got here is how to use react context effectively, essentially an introduction to react context and related caveats uh, on when you use it. So if you're just getting started with react and not sure how context works, do check it out. Next article we got here is how to create a multi line string with template literals, a tutorial on template literals. Nothing more to say here. If you already know how they work, you won't really find anything new. Next article is React JSX and rendering, a pretty basic introduction to how JSX works and how does it tangle into the whole React and rendering. Uh... Oh, God damn, I'm, t I'm terrible at this. But again, how does it uh, how does it work together with the React and rendering of the React components? So if you're just getting started with the React, it's a pretty good one. Next article we got here is building a Google Map in React. A pretty basic tutorial on using third-party library as in Google Maps and rendering it within a React component. If you already know how to do that, you won't really find anything new here. Next article we got here is deeply understanding JavaScript async and await with examples. A really good introduction to async await and promises uh, at a you know with a very good of uh, got them with a very good no with a lot of very good examples. So if you are still struggling to understand async awaits, this one is for you. Next article we got here is Mongo schemas with Pokemon, an introduction to MongoDB schemas on an example of basically building a Pokemon database. Uh, it's quite a good one. So if you're still confused about Mongo schemas, do check it out. Next article we got here is JavaScript async await and loops. If you were curious as to how async and await works in different types of loops, including, you know, the basic for loop and then a filter for each and so on and so forth. Do check it out. This article does give you a pretty good introduction to all of that. Next article we got here is Node.js file system API beginner friendly guides. Just as the title says, this is pretty much the very beginner friendly introduction to Node.js and working with files. Next article we got here is the circle of react lifecycle, an introduction to the react component lifecycle. So specifically the class based components, you won't find any hooks here, but it is a really good one. If you are just getting started for react uh, with react, uh, it is quite recommended. Next article we got here is react navigation versus react native navigation, which is right for you. If you're just getting started with react native and still figuring out which navigation to use, this article does a pretty good job of comparing the two most popular options. Next one we got here is the perfect unit tests. The article talking about sort of the best practices of unit testing, I guess, um, you know, figuring out what is the bad test, what is the good test and how do you actually write your tests so that they are Useful for everyone, let's put it this way. Quite good uh, starting guide for writing unit tests, essentially. All right, and I think, 
nearly the last one. No, that's not the last one. I'm I'm conf I'm confusing things now. Okay, continuing. We got uh, serving the UJS apps on GitHub pages. A relatively short guide on how to set up your own uh, website using Vue.js from GitHub Pages. If you're looking for something like this, do check this one out. Next one we got here is Phantom Props Unnecessary Renders and what no one told me about React.memo function. This is sort of a tutorial and overview of how React Memo works and how does React handles component re-rendering as well. So it's sort of, you know, more higher level overview of that. So if you are again, just getting started with React, and still not completely understand how exactly React re-renders the component, how it traverses the tree and stuff like this, do check this one out. It gives a pretty good um, idea of how that works. All right, next thing we got here is easy automatic NPM publishers. Uh, this is weirdly enough published on NPM blog. I don't think I've ever seen them before publishing any tutorials, but uh, I guess that's a first. So it's an article that talks about how to set up the uh, CI to auto publish your packages so that it is done in a reliable way with unit tests, automatic version bumping, and so on and so forth, which is quite nice starter, essentially, if you never did that, and you're not sure how exactly do you handle this with NPM specifically. Next article we got here is using ES6 and NPM modules in Google Apps Script. Um, this is an introduction to Google Apps Script and how to set up the JavaScript project that uses it. I honestly never heard about Google Apps Script, but you know, this is like um, a very, seems to be a very niche thing. I'm not sure I would use that, but maybe you do, and maybe you wanted to use JavaScript with it, then this article is for you. Next one we got here is React Suspense with Fetch API. Now, I think this is actually, yes, this is the first proper article and uh, this is an interesting one. So I, I don't know if I, <laughs> like here's the thing. So we got the React Suspense, right? And React Suspense is that mechanism that allows you to prefetch, dynamically fetch components or data and then display them. I mean, okay, currently it's just for components, right? So we got the Suspense for uh, asynchronous components and you can render them dynamically fetch them and then render it once the component is loaded, right? So the suspense for data according to the react dev team is coming later on. Now the article is basically talks about, um, I guess, abusing react suspense for components to make it work for data, which is on one hand incredibly cool. So like the idea behind it is pretty neat. So the author here went into the inner workings of React Suspense to figure out exactly how it works and then used it or abused it, I'm not sure which one it is actually, to create a use fetch hook that actually allows you to um, create a dynamic component that is rendered within the Suspense with a loading placeholder, but actually fetches data, not the component itself. The article itself is right up on how exactly it works and what exactly needs to be done. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's actually really cool. I'm not sure if I would recommend using it in production because as again, you know, on one hand, it's kind of using, on the other hand, kind of abusing the suspense. And I'm not sure that the suspense for data would work in the same way. So there's a decent chance that this library will break. Nonetheless, it's a really cool one. Hey, Tim, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got why I prefer React over Vue, a uh, comparative article that uh, basically outlines why the author prefers React over Vue, specifically when working with the Laravel framework, because it seems that Vue is sort of the default for Laravel apps, which is quite interesting and something I did not know, for example. So if you are working with Laravel and if you are maybe working with Vue and, and thinking, you know, hey, maybe I should try React, then definitely do give this one a read. It outlines the advantages React has over Vue, specifically, for example, with um, when using with TypeScript, because it seems like um, Vue with TypeScript has some shortcomings and not as easy to set up as React, which is, you know, expected. But um, yeah, it's, it's quite a good one. So if you're still pondering whether you should try React if you're really using Vue or if you are, I don't know, choosing between two, then do check this one out. Next article we got here is JavaScript array push is 945 times faster than array.concat, which, you know, when you th start to think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Because when you do array concat, you essentially create a new array and then put two of the existing arrays into it, right? Which obviously is gonna be slower than just pushing to an existing array. Now this 945 times actually is the interesting bit. 
The author here goes into the uh, sort of investigation as to why is there so much difference and how exactly can you implement those yourselves as in, you know, naive JavaScript implementations of concat and push to compare which one would actually work faster. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. There's some pretty interesting things. Uh, make sure to read the comments as well, because there are people with uh, experience in the uh, essentially JavaScript engines commenting on why is that that might be the case, specifically Chrome. Um, so there's the there might be biased results, for example, for Chrome and likely other browsers because they have special case arrays that are known not to be sparse, which obviously makes it a bit slower and there so basically the whole article is is quite great even though you know the topic sounds very simple and the discussion is worth a read as well so if that sounds interesting do check it out right next thing we got here is probably my favorite one from this week uh, the vs code team just announced remote development uh, with vs code you remember when we talked about the article when they introduced the way to split the vs code into essentially server and client bits well, they finally uh, seem to be moving further with that thing is now you can, uh, for now, just with the VS Code Insiders build, you can actually use VS Code to work with the remote system. Uh, remote, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, physically remote, it can be still your machine. The cool use cases they outline here are, first of all, is the Windows subsystem for Linux, something that I use pretty much daily in, in my Windows machine for development. Now, the way I work around currently around it is that uh, when you have the VSL, it's essentially isolated from the core Windows 10 uh, file system, right? So it's, it's like it's a Linux system and you cannot really access files unless you create them in the Windows side. But if you do that, there's like a bunch of caveats applied. So I was like, okay, I, you know, I want to develop within VSL. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to install the X server. I'm going to install the VS code inside the Linux part. And then I'm just going to run the VS code inside of Linux, which works fine. But you obviously it is a bit more sluggish, a bit slower than the native one, and it's not as convenient, right? Uh, now, what this allows you to do is this allows you to take your VS Code in the Windows, install a special server, which is actually auto installed by VS Code within your VSL, and then work with the VSL files as if it were your local files, which is really cool. Now, this is just one use case. The second one is even more fascinating. You can actually do that with containers. Yes, you can actually set up a special uh, build process for Docker container and work directly within the container itself. Uh, also works with, obviously with stuff like SSH and you know any remote access. This is a really cool and a really exciting step towards the essentially headless VS Code so that you can have a UI in a browser and have your you know VS Code remote backend running somewhere. And this is, super cool. So if you want to try it, you will need the VS Code's insiders built for now. And then you will need a special remote development extension, which is super easy to set up. I've tried it on my Windows, as I said, and it's it's really easy and works really well. So yes, if you are curious to check it out. Next thing we got here is a pretty lengthy article called optimizing batch processing jobs with RxJS. This is a kind of tutorial that shows you how you can use RxJS to well, optimize and simplify as well batch processing jobs with um, observables. And it is a really good one. So the cases, the use cases that are covered in this article are pretty realistic. So it's something you would see in a normal world. And the description of how the RxJS actually helps you during these use cases is quite good. So if you are doing any batch processing and you were considering using RxJS but wasn't convinced, make sure to read this one. Uh, hey, Kevin Lurk, welcome to the stream. Yes, uh, thank you for dropping by. I know your internet is not very good, but you know, thank you for <laughs> joining us anyway. All right, continuing. We got optimizing performance with resource hints. So resource hints, if, if you didn't know, is those additional attributes you can put on the HTML tags like DNS prefetching or uh, pre-connecting or pre-rendering or prefetching resources, right? And this article talks about when do you use them, why do you need them, and what exactly are the use cases and when you should not use them as well, which is kind of cool. So if you were curious about those, if you're still considering of whether you know you need those in your code base, then definitely check this one out. It does a really good job of explaining what those are and how do they work. 
Next article we got here is uh, also a really cool one. So uh, this one is running a command line tool written in Golang on browser with WebAssembly. So it talks about, um, well, it, it actually, so I did a video on something similar, but in my case, uh, what I did was I took the Golang library and then compiled it to use in a browser, right? So we had a video on that uh, somewhere in the YouTube channel, it should be there. I think we used the markdown parser or something like this. Uh, well, in this case, the author went even further and it turns out the Golang actually allows you to invoke the command line tools through WebAssembly. So what you can do is you can tell, or you can take the existing Golang command line interface, uh, like in this case, it was a PDF CPU tool that basically is PDF manipulation written in Go. He compiled it to WebAssembly and then in the browser directly, he allows the user to upload the PDF and manipulate it using this specific Golang tool, which is really, really cool. So there's a pretty detailed write up on how to do that. So if that sounds interesting, um, do check it out. It is like, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty damn cool. So if you know, if you uh, were wondering why, how can you use Golang with WebAssembly or how can you port maybe existing Golang tool into WebAssembly, then well, you, there is a pretty good answer right over here. So check it out. That is actually it for the articles. Now we're coming to the shorter bits. Uh, the first short thing we got here today is the uh, faster, more feature rich internationalization APIs in V8. This is a separate uh, shorter article that um, outlines the updates that have been shipped in V874 that we talked about last week, I believe. And uh, this time around, it specifically covers the changes and improvements of Intel API, which are pretty significant. So there's like performance, new features and stuff like this. So if you're working with internationalization, definitely check this one out. Next um, thing we got here is the PSA for everyone. If you are still using Node.js version six, then you should immediately switch to at least version eight or better to 10 or maybe even 12 because uh, node version six is now end of life. It was end of life on April 30 and there will be no longer any update, even the critical one. So you should be switching now. Next thing we got here is uh, intent to implement from the Blink team, a picture in picture for arbitrary content, which sounds really awesome. So if you didn't know, if you go to something like YouTube right now, right? And if you open, well, any HTML video really, um, and, uh, there is a button that says picture in picture that actually works in majority of, um, I think all of the essentially Chromium based browsers. And, and I believe that was also working in Firefox. For now, this is only possible for video content, right? So this is a specifically addition to video tag that allows you to pop up any video, make it picture in picture, and then drag it around wherever the hell you want. Now this uh, proposal that we have over here is actually to do the same, but for any web content. So imagine you would be able to open an app, say you have some sort of an element inside of the page that you wanna pop out, like the viewer account on Twitch. You will be able to do that, which sounds actually pretty cool. And I could see quite a lot of use cases for that. So that is an exciting thing. And the cool thing is that it's also already a part of the official spec. So um, I imagine it's gonna be available in other browsers as well, which is kind of awesome. Next thing we got here is code sandbox uh, updates that added Svelte 3. So if you wanted, if you looked at the previous podcast or maybe Svelte article and thought it was really cool and you wanted to play around with it, but did wanna set up it locally, well, now you can just open code sandbox.io slash s slash Svelte and just play around with it. It works really well. It supports, um, you know, formatting, syntax highlighting and everything that you would expect from the IDE to support. And it is really cool. So if you ever wanted to give it a shot, you can now do that in the browser. Uh, next thing we got here is introducing now dev serverless on localhost. Um, now I don't like the serverless word anymore because I don't think it means what people think it means. Like it's supposed to be without server, but like, serverless as localhost sounds absurd to me. But anyway, so there is this now command line utility and now uh, now shell hosting service, right? That is sort of serverless uh, hosting service provided by the side guys, which are the makers of the Next.js framework. Server itself is quite nice for some use cases. I've had some problems with it while trying to use it for, you know, long running scripts, for example, but it seems it's aimed to be sort of Lambda function uh, kind of thing. 
Well, now they've added the now dev command, which allows you to test out your serverless deployments locally, which is kind of cool. I still don't like the word serverless. I like, I mean, you know, the whole thing to me is that it doesn't make sense because there's there's still some servers out there hosting that stuff, right? So it's, there's got to be a better word for it. It's it's sort of like pay per use or something. I'm not sure, but I just don't like the word serverless, okay? <laughs> but anyway, it's, uh, if you're using now, that's a really cool. If you're not using now, then it actually might be an interesting uh, way to play with it without paying for it, even though the free tier they have is actually pretty generous. But uh, yes, there you go. So now you can uh, do it locally. The cool thing is that uh, this also comes with uh, zero lock-in, as they say, because since you can run it locally, all the now framework and builders and clients and whatever are now open source. And essentially, you can just deploy it on your own server if you want to, which is kind of awesome. So I'm planning to check out the source code at one point as well. All right. Next thing we got here is the uh, Chrome 76 uh, now has promise.all settled uh, enabled by default and shipped in it basically. So uh, there's been a proposal like a few weeks ago, I think, and it's now already complete. So that's, that's kind of really, really fast paced development. It is already stage three. So I guess, you know, since it makes a lot of sense, uh, they pushed it uh, through quite heavily. So there you go. All right, and the last thing I want to highlight in the uh, small things here, I mean, it's not actually a small thing, but it's just very awesome and very interesting. So there was the Facebook Developer Conference 2019 with a ton of videos and a ton of talks about React, Relay, GraphQL, and whatever the hell you imagine. There is like a million talks here. I don't like how many videos, there's like about 100, 82 videos. So if any of that sounds interesting, make sure to check it out. There is a lot of exciting topics. You know, as much as I don't like the Facebook as a company, they have some incredible engineers working there. And it's always really cool to watch and listen to basically what they do within the Facebook, within the specific tiny teams, including the AI stuff, including the mixed reality, AR and whatever. There's like topics covering just about everything. It's absolutely fascinating. So quite highly recommend it if you have some free time or maybe just watch it in the background. All right, that is it for the short and awesome things. Now we're coming to the releases. We have quite a lot of them. And the first one being Electron version 5, which uh, finally upgrades the Chromium to version 73, which is still lagging a tiny bit behind the latest Chrome version. Uh, but you know, this is just one version of difference now, not too bad. Um, the interesting thing is actually now comes with a Node.js version 12 being the latest node and obviously V873. So if you are using Electron, you should definitely consider updating it because both Chrome 73 and Node 12 come with an incredible number of optimizations and it's definitely worth upgrading for performance and memory gains. So there's a bunch of also breaking changes. So make sure to check those ones out as well. Next release we got here is Babylon version 4.0. Babylon JS, if you never heard about it, is a WebGL based graphic engine slash framework slash thing for working with 3D. I honestly, you know, since this is not my area, I don't really work with it, but I've heard a lot of uh, very good things about it from people who do. And it looks absolutely amazing. Like the stuff, the demos they have here are mind blowing. So if you're working with 3D and you wanted to try maybe work with it in, in WebGL, then definitely check this one out. Seems like it's a pretty good one. Next release we got here is VS version 7.0. This is um, among like one of the few libraries that we're gonna have releases today that basically do major version bumps just to drop node six among other things, because again, node six is end of life. So, you know, you no longer should support that and no longer should work with it, which is a perfect sense. There is additional behavior changes. So make sure to check out those notes, uh, release notes as well if you're upgrading. Next release we got here is Relay version four. This is the release that was announced on, again, Facebook developer conference. I personally never used Relay, so I cannot tell you much about it. I just know that this is a framework for building apps that's based upon GraphQL essentially and uh, made for React specifically, but I never used it, so cannot tell you much here. But, uh, you know, check out version four if you are using it. Uh, next release we got here is .env. They just updated to version eight. And again, the breaking change is dropping support for node six. So if you're upgrading, be sure that you are not running version six. 
Uh, next release we got here is Sapper version 0.26. They are finally updated Sapper to support Svelte 3 with a bunch of other things. If you never heard about Sapper, this is basically Next.js for Svelte, which makes the Svelte development a lot easier. So if you wanted to dive in and, and you know don't mind setting up stuff locally, then definitely check out Sapper. Seems to be quite nice. All right, next release we got here is Ava version 2.0 beta. So uh, one of the changes again is dropping node six uh, for the 2.0 release and requiring at least node 8.9.4, which is I believe the latest LTS version. And then there's a bunch of other major features coming to Ava, which you know, if you're using it, then uh, it looks pretty good. All right, uh, next thing we got here is the release of a version 5.0 beta of React Doggen. And uh, this is a tool for extracting information about React components uh, for documentation purposes. It is a Facebook internal tool, I believe, and it was licensed as something different, but now they relicensed this as MIT. And there's also improved performance, TypeScript support, and a bunch of other things. So if you are basically looking for ways to document your React code, then definitely do check this one out. It looks pretty good. Right, and the last two releases we got here is Node version 12.1, which just, um, yeah, just a bunch of minor things, really nothing of importance, but you know, if you're living on the edge, make sure to update. And then Node 11.15, which adds TLS v3 support with a bunch of other minor changes. Uh, I'm not sure why would you use still 11.15 when there's 12, but if you do, then make sure to update as well. Right, now we are coming to the libraries and demos section. The first library we got here is Pastel, the framework for effortlessly building Inc apps. Uh, if you never heard about Inc, it's a really cool library for building command line interfaces using React. Like you literally write React components and it updates as a CLI app, which you can be you know as dynamic as you want. And Pastel is sort of like Next.js for it, which essentially, you know, you just create, uh, you do install Pastel, you do Pastel build, Pastel dev, and uh, Pastel build for some reason again, not sure why that happens, but the idea is that you can use the file system as your project structure, which is the approach I quite like. So essentially you create commands folder and then you create command name.js and the pastel will handle everything else for you, which looks really cool. So if you are building command line apps, uh, decently complex ones, I guess, do check this one out. Looks like a really awesome framework and I should probably start it uh, until I forget about that. All right, next thing we got here is Shepherd. Guide your users uh, through a tour of your app. This is, as you expect, the code that allows you to create the guided tours of your web pages, which uh, looks relatively easy to use actually. So they have the very nice tutorial here, very nice demo. And the cool thing is that they have the specific framework wrappers here. So there's Angular Shepherd, Ember Shepherd, React Shepherd, and Vue Shepherd. So if you wanted to do something like this for your app, definitely check it out, seems to be quite nice. All right, next thing we got here is HTTP view. Uh, intercept HTTP in HTTPS with one click, explore and examine traffic up close and discover exactly what's going on uh, with your code and what is sending. Now, uh, here's one caveat, like the, the whole, there's a GIF with a demo and it looks really cool. It's sort of like uh, Fiddler, but you know, uh, nicer, more modern one, I guess. Uh, now here's the thing is that it says that HTTP view is the first release of HTTP toolkit a suite of beautiful and open source tools for debugging, testing, and building with HTTP and HTTPS on Windows, Linux, and Macs. My problem is, first of all, it looks amazing, no doubt. So I, I've like I've, I've looked at it, I downloaded it, I tried it, it works amazing. It will have some premium features, but whatever. Now, what bothers me is that it says it's open source, but there is no link to GitHub and I wasn't able to find any sources at all. So I, I'm curious if the author will release it later, but you know, if if you are worried about it not being open source then maybe just keep your eye on and let's see how that comes. Because I would love to see the source code for that. That actually looks pretty cool. All right, continuing. We got JS Min Bench. Uh, benchmark for JavaScript minifiers, uh, really cool one. So this basically compares a bunch of different minifiers uh, on a different stats. Seems to be very well thought through, with a bunch of different compression and, and runtime comparisons and stuff like this. So if you're evaluating different minifiers and uh, trying to figure out which one to use, then do check this one out. It seems to be quite good, uh, like quite a good way to compare them. Is what I want. To, is what I'm trying to say, right? 
All right, continuing, we got mod talk, uh, easy access to NPM package documentation, including the offline access, if I believe. Uh, it's an electron based tool that allows you to easily access docs for just about any NPM published package. Uh, it seems to basically figure out on its own where the hell the docs for the package are and show it to you in a nice interface. So if you are, if this sounds useful, do check it out. I don't know, I personally, rarely go into the docs actually now that i think about it i always end up going directly into the package source code which is not the way that you should do things but somehow my brain is broken probably because of that but um, there we go all right next thing we got here is react use gesture library from react spring team a uh, bread and butter utility for component tied mouse and touch gestures in react so there is the specific touch and basically gesture control thing that's there's some really slick animations over here, as you would imagine. I mean, React Spring is, an, is a fantastic library for animating React stuff. And now you have a gesture-based interaction to go along with it. And it's version five already, and it's just three kilobytes in size, which looks absolutely amazing. So if you were looking for a gesture interaction library for React, do check this one out. I should, again, probably start it until I forget. Next thing we got here is a new book by Mr. Gettify, none, none other than the author of You Don't Know JS books that are absolutely awesome and I think everyone who does JS should read. Now this one uh, is a new book from him called Functional Light JavaScript and it talks about the balanced pragmatic uh, look at functional programming in JavaScript. As usual, it is available absolutely for free on GitHub. But you can also buy it on LeanPub and Amazon if you want either a physical or a PDF copy of it. Uh, so yes, if you are working with JavaScript and you are still confused about the functional programming, wanted a good introduction to it, then I would absolutely recommend it because uh, knowing uh, Mr. Gettify, his stuff is always just really, really good. All right, next thing we got here is micro ORM with K in micro. A simple TypeScript ORM for Node.js based on data mapper, unit of work, and identity map patterns. Supports MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite databases, which I found to be interesting. So I don't think I've ever seen ORMs that actually support both SQL and MongoDB, like as in, you know, non-SQL object DB databases. And this one written in TypeScript and uh, seemed to be pretty cool, actually. So I looked through the docs, and the examples they have are quite interesting. So if you were looking for ORM that would allow you to work with those databases, check this one out. This seems to be quite cool. Right, next thing we got here is GraphQL Birdseye, an utility to view any GraphQL schema as a dynamic and interactive graph. Uh, they have a really fancy GIF here that illustrates a complex schema. And they also have a demo where you can try it out yourself. It's um, yeah, that's like they have a bunch of example schemas. This looks really cool. So it actually allows you to go into the schema, see the relations, see how the things connected and zoom in and check out the properties. And uh, seems like a very good tool if you have a little bit there. Let me try that again. Seems like a very good tool if you have a very complex GraphQL schema. All right, continuing, we got Rich UI tooltip that was just released. Uh, so if you never heard about Rich UI, it's a React component library that aims to sort of provide the simple components uh, like buttons, dialogs, alerts, tooltips, tabs that are easy to use and also accessible. So the accessibility is one of the goals. And this one adds the accessible tooltips to React that looks absolutely awesome. Um, so yes, if you wanted a nice tooltip, then do check this one out. It's basically completely stylable and animatable and whatever the hell you want, a really flexible one. And once again, it is 100% accessible. So we'll work on any screen readers or anything like that. Right, next thing we got here is TSDX, a zero config CLI for TypeScript package development. If you are working with TypeScript and you develop TypeScript packages, and this thing basically gives you a way to do this in one command. It set up everything for you and then gives you a bunch of tools to sort of work and release things using it. Looks quite nice. So if you're working with TypeScript, yeah. <laughs> what is wrong with me today? So if you're working with TypeScript, make sure to check this one out. All right, next thing we got here is Medium, a functional CSP library using async await keywords. So CSP is communication, communicating sequential processes, right? And if you ever written in Golang, then 
Golang has channels, which is essentially the implementation of CSP. So this seems to mimic the Golang style of channels, but using a sync await, which actually looks quite good. So if you if you know what CSP is and you wanted to work with it, um, then do check this one out. This seems to be a pretty good implementation of it. All right, continuing. We got VS Code CSS navigation, a plugin for VS Code that allows you to go to definition from HTML to CSS and find all the references and essentially reach your experience with the CSS classes in uh, VS Code, which looks quite nice. Also works with uh, compiled languages like SAS and LESS and stuff like this. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. Next thing we got here is React Awesome Spinners. Awesome Spinners for React built with styled components, meaning they don't have any CSS or anything like that that you need to include. Uh, they are still relatively big, so 61 kilobytes. I don't know if you can hear my cats going crazy in the background. They're just destroying some paper boxes over there and it's just really loud, at least for me. Hopefully you guys cannot hear that. Uh, but okay, yes, React Awesome Spinners. Um, look quite nice. I mean, yes, so they are relatively big and I don't know if they are tree shakeable because if they are, that would make them a lot smaller, which would be kind of neat. But uh, if you were looking for spinners, do check this one out. Now, next thing we got here is Sparser, a framework for various language parsers that also comes with actually a ton of existing parsers uh, like Markdown, Markups, including Jekyll, Jinja, HTML, XSLT, and so on and so forth, including scripts like JavaScript, JSON, QML, whatever the hell you want. So if you were looking for a framework for language parsers, I guess this is what you have to look at. It looks pretty nice. Like the uh, demo and examples they have on sparser.io are also pretty awesome. Like it seems to have a really good uh, sort of output that it produces that you can work with. All right, continuing, we got web-based React components from Uber. I believe they just open sourced it recently, but it's already version 6.16. As you might imagine, it was internal. Um, this are some really nice components. It's basically yeah, just a set of components, uh, sort of UI library that you would expect with, you know, button, button groups, inputs, breadcrumbs, tabs, accordions, file pickers, whatever the hell you imagine uh, for React. And yeah, it looks slick looks nice. So if you were looking for a full on library that you can just use somewhere, then definitely check this one out. This seems to be quite nice. And the um, the way that you use it is also very convenient. So there you go. Right, next thing we got here is text block, a JavaScript tool for adjusting size, leading and grades to cast continuously responsive typography. I have no idea what half of those words mean. But essentially, it's sort of the thing for typography. The cool thing is that it actually works over your current CSS as a progressive enhancement. So if you if you want to do some typography over your stuff, then check it out. This seems to be a nice tool. Right, next thing we got here is sql.js. Uh, I believe I've seen this one quite a few times already, but I don't think I've ever covered it here. At least the deduplication uh, search didn't actually find it when I created a new episode, so I guess I didn't. So the author here took the SQLite, which is the embeddable SQL database, right? We written, I believe it's written in C originally and compiled it to WebAssembly uh, and JavaScript. Uh, I think way before WebAssembly was a thing, it was actually compiled to pure JavaScript using ASM.js. And now the later versions are actually using WebAssembly. So you get essentially WebAssembly based SQLite that you can just use anywhere, which is kind of awesome. Um, I haven't had time to you know, do a deep dive into that, but I would be very curious to see how would the performance differ between the older versions, which was pure ASM.js and JavaScript versus the newer ones, which are essentially WebAssembly and uh, yeah, the newer versions, you know, like the, the, the proper bytecode basically. So I'd be curious to see that, but uh, nonetheless, a really cool project. So if you're curious, do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is Laconia. Uh, create well-crafted serverless applications effortlessly. This is uh, seems to be a framework for serverless apps, or I guess micro framework as they call themselves. So if you're working with serverless and we're looking for something like this, do check it out. They seems to have uh, quite extensive documentation, and there's like a lot of um, a lot of examples available for deployment for you know Amazon Web Services and stuff like this. I again, I am not 
too proficient with that, so won't really tell you anything about that. Uh, as again, did not have time to try that specifically and only have basic experience with the function as a service platforms. But uh, there you go, that sounds interesting. Do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is Dockly, uh, immersive terminal interface for managing Docker containers and services written in JavaScript. So you can just npm install it and then you get a nice, uh, I guess, top like or h top like interface that shows you basically all containers and allows you to do things to them. That looks quite nice. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I guess, I, I mean, I'm still, I still prefer command line, you know, like text only tools for majority of time, but maybe you prefer more UI like experiences. So then this doesn't look half bad. All right, next thing we got here is unchange library from Mr. Sindrasaurus. Looks like he discovered proxies uh, and now is using them for like 90% of his libraries. So this one actually allows you to wrap any object into the unchange proxy and then modify it and get callbacks on whenever that values are changed essentially. Very straightforward, simple library as it typically happens with the projects he does. Uh, but maybe you are looking for something like this. So do check this one out. This is actually it for the libraries and demos. Now we're coming to the interesting and silly bits. And uh, we actually have a lot of, uh, well, terrifying and interesting stuff today. First thing I want to highlight is there's been a bunch of uh, new ransomware attacks. So uh, it looks like for people who don't use strong enough passwords or don't, don't use two-factor authentication or uh, don't proper or publish their authentication codes for GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, or any other Git-based repos online. Um, the hackers essentially uh, change the contents of repository to a message that says to recover your lost code, send us 0.1 Bitcoin to the following address, and then tell us your Git, uh, GitHub repo or whatever, and the payments, proof of payment, and we'll put your code back. If you don't do it within 10 days, we delete your code, which is very silly in my opinion, but yeah, that's the thing. So if you are, if you have any important code on GitLab, GitHub, or Bitbucket, first of all, don't reuse passwords. Second of all, enable two-factor authentication. It's not that hard, and this is essentially gonna protect you. And of course, don't publish your tokens online. So. Seems to be not that many repos affected. It seems to be like around 400 repos so far among across all the platforms. And all three platforms are essentially investigating why and how that happens and uh, how to mitigate that. I believe there was already a statement from GitLab saying that, okay, there might be a breach, but we're investigating. GitHub and Bitbucket are quiet so far, but again, you know, this happened yesterday evening. Friday evening, obviously, we'll probably expect something uh, more next week. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is the new phishing method, the inception bar. Um, obviously that doesn't actually work in this view. So if I switch to emulating the, uh, say iPhone X or whatever, or yeah, I guess iPhone X would work, right? So if I refresh, you would see that it actually, um, where is it? It just, it was, it was just there. What happened? Because, um, come on. I know, is it my JavaScript just cutting it? It might be, is this one? No. Okay, but let me just tell you that I tried it on mobile and it actually, oh, there we go, now it appears. So the, the idea of this uh, phishing method is quite straightforward. I just wanted to give you a PSA. It only works obviously if you use Chrome because the, um, the phishing idea is that once you scroll the page, the Chrome uh, navigation bar actually hides, right? So if you're on a mobile. So the idea is once it hides and once you scroll down, you actually replace that navigation bar with a mimicked navigation bar that actually displays a different URL. So in this case, it's a bank URL, which means that then if you show user a login page, that uh, there might be some users that just enter their credentials because they think that this is actually the bank or whatever, right? So be careful with that. This seems to be like a pretty you know, uh, valid attack vector. So just keep your eyes out for this. All right, next thing we got here is the um, Firefox uh, extension issue that is essentially, <laughs> this is a silly one. So the Firefox uh, yesterday, I think it was like 12 hours ago. Yes, 12 hours ago, 
disabled all extensions across all browsers because the intermediate signing certificate has expired. So somebody forgot to renew the certificate in uh, one of the updates. It expired and non-extensions any longer worked in any of the Firefox versions for about 10 hours. I believe they fixed it just recently. So um, first mitigation is now complete. So if you update, it should start working again. But uh, it is a very silly bug. And it is just amusing to you know see the whole situation unfold just because someone forgot to renew the certificate. But uh, yeah, that's the thing. All right. And the last thing I got here today is the announcement from Mozilla. They actually announced a, a plan to ban all of the Firefox extensions that contain obfuscated code, which, I mean, on one hand, that sounds like a reasonable thing to do. On the other hand, I wonder, like, how, how is the... Uh, so I guess it's not minified code, right? Because you want to minify your code anyway because it improves performance. But I guess they talk about specifically obfuscation that just creates a load of bollocks instead of proper JavaScript code that is really hard to uh, reverse, right? Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting to see. I believe that Google already had the policy like this uh, quite some time. Oh yeah, state of this. So it's, it's, it's already in effect from October last year and it's in effect on January 1st. So I guess, you know, Google is more or less the same. And now it's also the Firefox, which I guess just makes it harder to push malicious code into extensions, which makes perfect sense. So there you go. Um, that is basically it from my side. So this was BXJS Weekly episode 61. If you guys have any questions, feel free to throw them right now into the chat. If you have any articles or things that I might have missed this week, feel free to throw them into the chat as well. Um, otherwise, that's basically it from my side. As usual, you can join our Discord server if you want to discuss any of the news or have any questions. Uh, we also have a Telegram channel where I post all the links that I collect over the week that are also doubled into our Discord server if you don't have Telegram. Um, there is also, so yes, as usual, you can watch the VOD on YouTube and listen to it on CastBox, iTunes, or whatever the hell you can find this. And uh, yes, that's basically it. Let me see. Great episode. Thank you. Uh, is there going to be any development streaming in the future? Yes, I do plan to do more development streams. I'm currently working on a new JavaScript basic course that I wanted to do for about a year now. And I think I finally sort of shaped it enough to record it. So I'm trying to figure out whether I should just sit down and record the course first and then do development streams more or whether I should try to mix it up together, but we'll see. There's some also some real life stuff happening in my life. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a bit busy in the last couple of months. That's why there's been no streams, but um, there's definitely gonna be more. I'm trying to sort the stuff out and do more things for the channel, for the uh, courses, for all of that kind of stuff. So yes, that is definitely the plan. And great steam. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm really happy to hear that you guys enjoyed it. All right. So any more questions, any more suggestions? If not, then I guess we can wrap it up here and I can go play more Yakuza because this game just ate my brain. If you haven't played Yakuza games, they are freaking amazing. <laughs> you should definitely give it a shot. It is so good. Okay. Doesn't seem like we have any more questions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Um, have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.